Welcome, and I, I want to spend hopefully about a half an hour telling you about this revolution in oceanography where we're using robots to explore the ocean. So I think what I'm going to do is start off by telling you a little bit about how the Oregon Ocean works and some of the things we're studying, and then I'll show you how the, we've transitioned for many of our measurements from ships, ship base, to these robots and tell you how they work. So this is uh, one of my favorite photos from Cape Perpetua, and it shows the Oregon coastal ocean from the dirty, muddy water near the coast. That's the sediment being resuspended by the waves. You go a little farther out, it's green. That's a lot to do with the plankton in the water, so it's a very productive ocean. And finally, out to the edge of the horizon where it's more of a deep blue or even a purple. That's the clear deep ocean offshore. So we study that whole transition between things happening far offshore and influencing the, the coast. And we really care a lot about the water that's right next to the coast because it affects the rocky intertidal communities as we've seen so much. So I'll start off a little, little more history. This is a picture of Wayne Burt, our founder at, in oceanography. And uh, this is a, a well-known photograph where he's standing in front of a diagram that says there's no data out here. <laughs> and that was, that was pretty much true. And so uh, my predecessors, who I'll introduce you as we, as we go through the talk, went out in ships and started filling in that gap. And I'll show you how the gliders have filled it in even more. Uh, now we're the College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences. So we've got all the parts of the, of the planet Earth. And uh, there's easily 500, perhaps more, people working in marine science. And I didn't put up my favorite logo, but instead of Oregon State University, it, it might be Ocean Sciences University. <laughs> so you guys can tell me why we care about the ocean. These are just some images I took from, uh, from the Oregon Ocean. We care about it because it provides sustenance. It, it provides food for a billion people on the planet. We all use it for recreation, transportation. It, it uh, helps disperse pollutants. And we're looking at it for energy sources. So perhaps you've heard about the wave energy that's trying to be developed. On the lower left is a buoy picture I took off your Quinn ahead. That's going to oscillate up and down in some way and gather energy from the waves. On the far right is a burning piece of methane hydrate that was taken off the seafloor from about 600 meters down, where it's cold enough and there's enough pressure to compress methane into a liquid, or excuse me, into a solid, actually into this snow. That's brought up and is, a, is an excellent energy source. There's more energy in that stuff than there is in all the other fossil fuels put together times 10 or so. Um, Another thing is that the ocean is very important for modifying the weather. So who enjoys the 55 degree nights around here, right? <laughs> that's from, as I'll explain, the cold water that's upwelled near the coast and then the winds come in, the sea breeze comes in every night and moderates our climate. And we know, as Nick suggested, there's some aspects of the ocean that are changing due to uh, global warming and, and, and other things. OK, so where are we in the global ocean? We're over in what's called the California Current. It's one of four currents uh, that lie on the eastern side of the ocean basins, the Humboldt, the Canary, and the Benguela. They're very productive areas. They're less than 1% of the surface area, but they provide 20% of the wild-caught seafood. So we're, we're very interested in these, and Oregon is an excellent place to study those. And that's because of this process called upwelling. What happens is in the summertime, we get winds from the north. So I've got a little picture here of the, the wind blowing down the coast. It pushes the water, but because the earth is rotating, the water spins off to the right in the northern hemisphere. And as it leaves the coast, it leaves a, a hole, in a sense, that needs to be filled in by cold water from below. And on the right-hand image is a satellite view of cold water that strip all along the coast. And so we want to understand how that process works. Further, that cold water brings up nutrients to the surface. So because those waters are down near the seafloor and 
they have access to the, to the nutrients. They'll come up into the light zone and you'll get plankton blooms. We've also been uh, very aware now of them bringing low oxygen waters from depth where there's less oxygen up next to, next to the coast. So we want to be able to study this uh, routinely. And again, just an image of what it looks like from a satellite. So on the right-hand side, that's the sea surface temperature. You can see that cold strip. This is from August. Okay, so if anybody, I'm sure you've all been out to the beach and stuck your foot in or maybe your whole body in. It's quite cold, maybe as low as earlier this year it was 48 Fahrenheit, so 9 or 10 centigrade right on the beach. You can see it's colder down near Cape Blanco, Port Orford, that area. There's more wind in that area. On the left-hand side is a chlorophyll image. That's the, that's the surface chlorophyll. That's the plankton that's in the water. So you can see it's almost a one-for-one -one match where that cold water comes up and you get plankton blooming. So I just wanted to show you what this looks like to your eye. This is a really intense bloom of plankton down near Port Orford. And this is not a bad thing. If you see this, uh, it's, it looks kind of a chocolate brown color. That's not a red tide or anything. That's good diatoms that are going to go to fuel the, the food chain. So let's see if we can get this little animation to work of, uh, of this process. Yes. So a undergraduate student at the time, Alan Dennis, made this animation uh, with us. He took kind of a virtual reality and built this uh, upwelling model. So there's, you can see the Willamette Valley and the coastal range. That's the wind coming down the coast. It pushes that surface water offshore and then upwells from below. And when we look at it from space, we'll see that cold water all along the coast. And then eventually you'll see the plankton blooms, and then those can fall to the sea floor and decay and pull some of the oxygen out of the water. So what we're going to use these gliders for are to fly through these clouds of plankton and low oxygen. So that's kind of a 3D view of all that. Alan did a great job on it. Okay. To, so I just showed you a bunch of satellite images. How do we know what goes on underneath the ocean? This is where it gets harder. So you could maybe do this for a little while. <laughs> Hold your breath. But what we've done historically is use ships. And this is kind of a history of the seagoing oceanographic vessels. So the Challenger expedition you may have heard of uh, really started out seagoing oceanography. In the days of sail, the RV Atlantis, which was Woods Hole's first oceanographic vessel. Then steam came on, and the RV Chain, for example, in the 50s. And then our research vessel, the RV Wacoma. Wacoma is a Chinook jargon for this, the sea. And we've operated Wacoma from 77 to 2012. We just retired her and replaced uh, Wacoma with the RV Oceanus. And this gives me a chance to show another one of my favorite quotes. I'll just read it out for you. It says, a computer looks pretty impressive on a college campus, but a well-equipped oceanographic vessel is a grander sight and makes a person want to work at sea. This is why you have to keep getting to sea. We can't do it all from keyboards and web pages. Um, this is from Henry Stommel, who was one of the more famous physical oceanographers. He figured out how the Gulf Stream works. Okay, so just a little bit more background. If you go out offshore, say in our RV Alaka, the 54-footer, you go out and you lower an instrument over the side down to the sea floor and measure the amount of oxygen in the water. So the plot shows along the, the axis to the right is more oxygen, depth goes down. So this is about 50 meters depth, just offshore. And that red line is a, what we call the hypoxia cutoff. So it, whenever the oxygen goes lower than that, the organisms are going to start uh, being stressed and eventually die even. So they, if they experience that, they have to get out of there. The fish will swim away. The invertebrates, the crabs and things will try. They may not get far enough. The things stuck to the bottom can't go anywhere, and they will suffer because of this. 
So this is one cast down through the water. If we go many years in a row, here's uh, lines from 22, 2003, et cetera. And it's this 2006 one, which is over here, that really caught our attention. Because it passed right through the hypoxic zone, and it went to zero, as low as we could detect it. And that's called anoxia, lack of oxygen. And it's the first time in the historical record that we had seen that. So there are changes in the coastal ocean that we want to be able to follow. OK, so let's go back and look at the set of measurements. And we'll look for the last 60 years. And these are measurements taken from instruments that look like that over on the upper right. They're lowered off a ship. And uh, I can tell you that the current rate the, the dollar rate for this vessel at sea is about $20,000 per day. So we go out fully equipped. We can work 24 hours, lower things over the side, do lots of experiments. This is what the data looks like from 1950 to 1999. So again, oxygen along the top. This time I'm, I'm going down to 800 meters. So I'm going to show you the really low oxygen that's down here. That's the data in the... the 50 to 99. Here's the data from 2000 to 2005. And what we want to watch is that area up around zero oxygen. Now watch what happens in 2006. This is an area of the continental shelf that was basically devoid of oxygen for the lower half of it or so. And what I want to emphasize is that there were uh, 4,000 measurements that went into this calculation. So from top to bottom, 4,000 of those measurements. All right, now we finally get to gliders. What are they doing for us? How do they work? So this is, you saw this guy sitting out on the table. This is a uh, underwater glider. It's an autonomous underwater vehicle, AUV. You may have heard about that. If you come later in the day, you'll hear about an autonomous air vehicle. This is an autonomous underwater vehicle. And we've been using these since uh, 2006 to go right across the upwelling zone. We want to sample autonomously back and forth on that line. And I'll show you some of the data. We measure temperature, salinity, the chlorophyll content, which is a measure of the plankton, the phytoplankton. We measure the particles that are in the water, the dissolved oxygen, and the speed of the water that's going uh, along the coast. So let's look at a little more detail about one of these guys. It's about as tall as I am. You can see me holding up on there. We're going to go outside and look at these guys. They weigh uh, 100 pounds in the air. So Piero and I had to pull them in and put them up there. When, they, when we put them in the water, they, dis, they displace the water and they float. And one of the keys to this is when we put them in the water, we make them neutrally buoyant which means they're exactly balanced to not go up or not go down. So we have a tank of water down at Western Avenue, and we balance them very carefully by adding weight in or out. And uh, I asked Piero to loan me a quarter, because if you take that floating glider and you put a quarter on top of it like that, it'll sink. So we do it very carefully to get that just right, because now what we're going to do is we're going to change the size of the glider by commanding a piston to go out, out of the nose. And as it comes out, it displaces more water. That will cause it to go up. If we want to go down, we pull that piston in, and we'll descend. So if you've been in a swimming pool, you know, you're floating on your back, and you fill your lungs up with water, you get bigger, and you displace more water, and you float better. So it's the same idea. It's a, it's a buoyancy, it's called a buoyancy engine. And by doing that, we can go up and down. And then the wings allow us to glide forward. So that's where the term glider comes from. And unlike an airplane glider, we, we go in both directions. We, go, we descend and glide down. We command it to turn around. It comes back up. And we gracefully glide through the, through the ocean. The, one of the biggest missing things from here is the propeller. There's no propeller on the back. There are plenty of autonomous underwater vehicles that run with propellers. That takes a lot of energy. You can only keep them out a day or so. These guys are very low energy. 
they use a half a watt of energy, and they can run for, some versions can run a month, some can go now nine months. So in this guy are a whole bunch of batteries, and I've just brought one of the battery packs, and we'll, we'll bring it outside too. It's uh, 20 pounds, and they're, it's just a whole bunch of C cells. So flashlight batteries, all packaged in a very special way. This one sits in the front of the vehicle, right up in here, and it's on a screw drive such that we can move it fore and aft. So what we do when we want to dive is we pull that piston in and we command the pitch battery forward. It moves forward and tips the glider over and down it goes. So if you've seen the uh, World War II submarine movies where all the guys run to the front, so you run to the front and tip it down and down it goes. As we approach the sea floor, we're pinging with, a, with, a, with, a, with one or every few seconds with a sound pulse. We listen for the bottom and we command it to turn around at three meters. So I'm two meters tall. Three meters is about like that. It turns around and comes back up. And then as we get up near the surface, we sense the pressure to the surface. We turn around and, and come back down until we're ready to communicate with home. And the way we do that is through that tail fin, which uh, I'd like to say is the most expensive part on the glider. So when you go out there, don't grab on it and rip it off. It's got a, a bunch of antennas in it, a iridium cell phone antenna, which goes up to the satellites and then down to shore. It's got the GPS uh, antenna for location. It's got a radio so we can talk to it on, from the ship. And then in the very back is a rudder so we can steer these guys. And we can use our cell phones to fly these things. So, uh, you know, this is actually not a smartphone, but if it was, I could, you know, open up my web page, find out where the glider is, command it to go to a different direction or get some of the data back. And students like Piero and others are flying these actively offshore just from their computer terminal, anywhere on the web. Okay, I've already told you about some of the sensors. Uh, the oxygen is way in the rear. Uh, what else do I want to say about it? I, th the reason this is happening now and not 30 years ago or even 20 years ago is this convergence of technologies. And, and Nick kind of introduced things. Um, the cell phones are reliable now. We now can put Pentium and better computers on four-inch cards. Uh, a, another huge step forward was in flash memory. All, the, all in your phones, right? You got a little tiny chip that holds a gigabyte. I mean, that's insane. We, we could never do that before. So now we can store all that data inside the glider and then retrieve it and get it back. We only send back a very little bit of the data to monitor things. I note, I note on there that we still need some advances in battery and, and power. And there's some clever things going on with that. OK, so we have a fleet of these now, a fleet being eight, I think. We had nine. We lost one. So hopefully we won't lose too many more. Got to find some wood. So uh, we started in 2005, and that, that's uh, the glider on the top. And we named these gliders Bob and Jane. And we named them after Bob Smith and Jane Heyer. And Bob Smith is in the audience, so Bob, you should give a wave. <laughs> is, is Jane here? Bob, is Jane here? No. OK. So Bob and Jane spent a lot of part of their career working on the Newport line, taking those measurements that I just showed you and told us a lot about how the ocean works with El Nino cycles, uh, the coastal productivity, the upwelling, all that. And as these robotic vehicles came along, we we wanted to start using those. So I, I told Bob and Jane about that we named these after them. And Bob said, ah, oh, what a great honor, Jack. Thank you for doing that. And Jane said, come on, Bob. They're just replacing us. <laughs> <laughs> and they were both right. <laughs> so we now have uh, four of these guys. And we have a different vehicle down on the lower right. That's called a, a, a UW Sea Glider. We asked for ours to be painted beaver orange. So it's in beaver orange. It, there's one of those out there, too. OK, 
Okay, so we have to operate these things. We have a, a highly trained set of technicians, a group of students, where we do that ballasting. We change the batteries. We make sure the sensors are working properly. There's one of those ballast tanks. Uh, as Nick said, we've been all over the world. That's me talking with Chilean colleagues to plan a mission off of Concepcion, Chile. And we deploy them from a variety of vessels. Here's a couple more. We can use things like the Pack Storm, which is a converted fishing vessel, or we can even use a rowboat. So these are not difficult things to get in and out of the water. And here's another animation from uh, courtesy of Alan, and it'll just show you how these glide gracefully through the ocean, taking these measurements around the clock. So again, we're, we're gliding down. You'll see that's the uh, temperature and salinity device on the left. The flashes of light are how we measure the plankton and the particles in the water. It now is pushing that piston out, pulling the battery back, and going up to the surface. When it gets near the surface, it inflates a air bladder in the tail, pops that little guy out, and communicates with home. And after we've been doing this now for, what is it, seven years, we've been trying to go back and forth on that line. So red and blue are different gliders. Blue is yet another one. And we've managed to, go, to be out there physically with one of these for 3,200 days. So uh, that's year round. We've gone back and forth on that line eight, eight, uh, almost 900 times. We've done 232,000 profiles. Okay, compare that to the 60 years of th there were 4,000 profiles. So you can see how this is revolutionizing what our access to the sea and what we can uh, keep our eyes on. The, the linear distance is 74,000 kilometers. So who knows how far it is around the globe in kilometers. See, I got a 50, 50, what? 50,000? Anybody else? That's close. 40,000 kilometers. So that's almost, we're getting close. We're going to have to have a big party when we, uh, when we go twice around. OK, so here's the data that we see. In the upper panel is the temperature. So you can see the cold water that's come up from depth and is near the, near the shore. That's the upwelling. The salinity is also higher at depth. It gets pulled up near shore. And then there's a chlorophyll bloom in uh, incredible detail showing us the various tongues of plankton coming down and feeding uh, organisms down below. OK, and then here's one that we hadn't seen in such detail before. This is the dissolved oxygen in the, in the ocean off Newport. Blue is low. Blue is bad for the, for the organisms. And what we can now see is instead of just that single cast, we can see how this whole area of hypoxia is localized to a certain area. And then we can start to talk about how it is along the coast because we can fly these gliders uh, throughout the ocean. And that area of lowest oxygen that you see in the dark blue, that's where we, with Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, found these huge crab die-offs and other invertebrates dying off that you may have heard of. So we're keeping an eye on this, both with the gliders and with the, our, the other ROVs. OK, you, you, as you get to see out here, we, we uh, put the OSU stickers on here. The, you know, that used to be the angry beaver. I guess we now have the, the nice beaver, or whatever it is. Nutri, I think it is. <laughs> and so uh, every three weeks, we have to go out and pick these guys up and change the batteries. And uh, we have our phone number on them, of course. So I don't know if we, Piero has the phone, but we always have the phone with the pilot in case somebody finds one of these things. We usually only about once a year does somebody find one of these at sea. Because they come up, they transmit the data, and down they go. So you've got to be right there to, to really see it. Well, one time there was a guy there in a fishing boat, and he grabbed the thing. And he called us up. He called Anatoly Arofif up, and he said, what should I do with this? And Anatoly said, is it, did you hit it? No. Is it, well, if it's still good working order, just let it go. So he let it go, and it's, it went for two more weeks. 
And we went out in the small boat to pick the thing up, and we got it back. And here's what we found. <laughs> so, so I was pretty upset at the time. <laughs> And then I told my wife, and she said, Jack, you would have done exactly the same thing. <laughs> so you get, anybody of you that go to fish know that you have your Sharpie on you to fill out your catch, right? So he just took out his Sharpie and <laughs> OK, here's, let me just tell you a couple more tales about this, and then we'll start to conclude. I'll tell you a little bit more about the future. What we can do with these is we can keep them out in really nasty weather that the ships aren't able to go. Okay, because these guys don't get seasick. The robots don't get seasick. So we managed to have Glider Bob out in a January storm. Here's uh, the wind record from a buoy. So one of these huge winter storms comes through. It, it blows 50 knots of wind that makes 30-foot seas. So what, what is that? 10 meters? You know, probably almost twice the height of this room. So you're not going to be out there in a vessel making measurements. And the wind, for example, on Yaquinicut Bay Bridge is 70 miles an hour, 75. And a colleague gave me this and noted that that tanker truck is now going zero miles per hour, <laughs> blown over by the wind. So we can get out there with, with gliders. And here's, uh, here's what we're seeing. Here's Glider Bob. This is a, looking down on a map. It's traveling from left to right. And it comes near the shore. And it's, it's showing you the velocity. The velocity of the water is to the north generally in the winter. And then we can look beneath the sea surface. And this is data we really have never seen before. This is temperature, dissolved oxygen, and, um, and really interestingly, the, the particle count in the bottom panel. So red are lots of suspended sediment. And then you get these amazing columns of material pulled off the seafloor and mixed into the water. That's uh, adding nutrients. It's actually adding iron to the system that Later on in the spring, we'll fuel the, uh, the plankton blooms. All right, a couple minutes about the future, and we'll, and we'll take questions and go out and look at the gliders. We want to be out in the ocean on a permanent basis. Ships, we will always need ships because we have to do experiments. We have to uh, catch animals. If you want to do a controlled experiment, you need to have a tank of water. But we can do a lot with robots, and we can do a lot with um, seafloor laboratories. So this, I want to tell you about the Ocean Observatories Initiative, funded by the National Science Foundation. This is the largest civ civilian uh, ocean agency investment ever. It's a $400 million construction project. And then we're going to plan to operate it for 25 to 30 years. So the idea is to get a permanent presence, get laboratories in the ocean that uh, researchers, students, and the interested public can access. So there'll be gliders in there, and there'll be what we call these uh, cables that go to the laboratories. So we're building this right offshore here. We went to the National Science Foundation, and we convinced them that the Pacific Northwest was a great place to do this study because it's got these uh, hugely productive ecosystems. There are those methane hydrates I told you about. We all know about the plate motions that are going on that could uh, likely lead to a big 9.0 earthquake, which will lead to tsunamis. So we want to understand the plate dynamics. It's just a great laboratory. So what we're doing is uh, building this. And going out of Pacific City is a cable that goes to the seafloor. It's dug in about four feet. It goes out to the uh, deep ocean, and then one leg of it runs out to axial seamount, so we can study the seamounts out there. Another leg makes a hard left, goes down to Hydrate Ridge off Newport, and it comes back up on the shelf to these areas that I've just been telling you about with high production and low oxygen. And just a couple of pictures. This is the 600-foot uh, vessel that installed the cable. That's the termination of the cable in Pacific City which is in a uh, telecommunication point for, the, for, the, for our cables, phone cables that go to Japan, Asia. So we reused uh, 
an area there. And we're in the middle of building all this. So that was just uh, the, the cable that came on to shore here. The idea is to run a whole fleet of these gliders. So we'll have six at a time running offshore and we can get a picture of the entire waters off the Pacific Northwest. And I didn't include the slide, but I, I might have it in an extra. Uh, the idea is to build this network all along the coast of the US. So the idea is, just like the National Weather Service has all this stuff in the air, right? We're starting to build the National Under, Underwater Weather Service, where we can get this data routinely and make better predictions about ocean circulation, ocean ecosystems. So we're going to be installing this over the next uh, year or so. We have a another set of moorings up off Grace Harbor because we want to look how Washington and Oregon contrast because they're on either side of the Columbia River that, that comes out. And here's a fanciful diagram of what this will look like when it's all done. There'll be seafloor observatories. You can jump on the web. You'll have a connection to it. Uh, we'll be able to manipulate the instruments and the data will come back instantly. And you guys can all get to that. So it's a, you know, it's a, your dollars, it's your tax dollars that are being invested and the data is free and available to everyone. I won't promise any whales coming out of the, uh, <laughs> the monitors. So this is just in conclusion. I think we're at the beginning of the robotic exploration of the planet ocean. And uh, come join us. So thank you. Uh, it's not quite clear to me, the cabling that is yet to be completed, right? So is all of the communication going to be subsurface? Uh, some of those vertical buoys you got, are any of them going to reach the surface or are they all subsurface? Yeah, great question. So I've described these autonomous vehicles. They fly around and talk back through satellites. On the seafloor we've got cables that just goes right back along the cable. As Jim says, we also have moorings that go from the seafloor all the way to the surface, chock full of instruments. They have buoys at the surface that will talk by a satellite link back to shore. So we have a couple alternative ways of getting the data back. Just for comparison purposes, you would say to take the ship out costs $20,000 per day. Out of curiosity, the yellow glider, what is its cost? Yeah, that that's the question I, I give this talk several times, and uh, usually the adults are shy to ask, but the kids always ask how much they cost. <laughs> <laughs> the first one we bought was uh, $80,000. They now cost about twice that, so $160,000. So if you take $20,000 a day in ship time, that's a week that you make up the time. Now, I want to stress we can't yet grab plankton samples or that kind of thing with a glider, but as we get more towards um, what are called genomic devices that we can sense the, the, uh, the gene sequences, you can start to think about using sensors like that on gliders to learn something more about the biology. Um, those 3,000 days, somebody can do the math about how much money we've saved. But my colleague Kip Sherman likes to say that he's personally saved the National Science Foundation, something like $3 million. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. In the lecture last night, Dr. Lutinko referred to the effect of upwelling on acidity near the coast, along the Oregon coast. Can you comment about that a little bit and explain? Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So those upwell waters are uh, low in dissolved oxygen. They're very high in dissolved CO2. Okay, and the way to think about that is that photosynthesis and respiration or decay are opposite to each other. So if you're decaying or respiring organic material, you're consuming oxygen and you're producing CO2. So those waters are laden with CO2. And we know the chemistry of the ocean takes that CO2, dissolves it, goes to bicarbonate, and it leads to more uh, positive hydrogen ions, and the pH is lower. It's significantly lower. The average pH of the ocean is about 8, 
In these waters, it's 7.5, 7.6. So as those waters come up to shore, they're so low in pH that they, they, uh, will, they will dissolve the carbonate shells that are in the area. So we're doing actively studying how that works now. And, and probably the, the uh, best evidence so far that it's causing a problem is in the oyster hatcheries in Oregon where the little tiny young guys are, aren't able to form their cells as easily. So it's just like any, like us, right? Our young are pretty vulnerable. So are the, so are the oyster larvae. So it's the same water, low oxygen, high CO2, low, low pH. No, this is, this is perfectly normal. This is all good stuff. What's, what's changing, we think, is those waters that are upwelled from depth globally are going down ever so slowly in oxygen. And they're also for sure changing their pH. And I'll just, let me just say a few words about that. Out in the open ocean, the, the warmer air temperatures and the higher CO2 levels, that goes into the ocean. So let's start with temperature. Warms up the upper layer. And when that's, that's more buoyant, it's, more, it's lighter. So it's harder to mix oxygen from the atmosphere down into the ocean. So we think that those deeper waters are tending down in oxygen. And as that gets near the shore and then is upwelled, it, it's lower. That's what we think is happening with oxygen. With CO2, we can directly track the anthropogenic CO2 into the ocean, and then it travels along lowering the pH, and then it comes up near our shore. So it's changes in the, what we call the upwelling source waters that are brought to the coast. The upwelling itself is a well-known thing and has been known for a long time. Yeah? You were showing some data from 06 that was dramatically different. <coughs> That's already seven years yeah. ago. So is it, does it take us a long time to analyze the data, or? Is the data consist is 06 an outlier? Yeah, great. Let me see if I can. Uh, I brought along the data from. Here we go. Okay, this is a complicated science geek uh, figure. But what it, what it does is on the bottom is 2006 and it goes up in time. And I could have added 12 and 13 on this. The blue colors are the low oxygen. They occur every summer. And 2006 is unusual in that the blue came all the way to the coast and it got really low. But you can see with your eye that in these recent years it has not been as bad. It's very variable. You can't go out in a ship and look once in a while. You got to be there all the time to see how it's changing. Yeah. Yes? With your data so far, it looks as though we can say, uh-oh, big, big problem. Big changes. So what, what we need to be talking about is how, and I'll use the oyster hatchery as an example, how, we're, how we can adapt to these changes. Because we're, at this point, with the CO2 that's already in the atmosphere and is already in the ocean, we're not going to reverse that. Even if we stop right now, things are going to still be coming along in those source waters and up to our coast. So what the hatchery folks discovered is that they shouldn't fill their tanks when the upwelling is happening. They should wait for the oceanographic conditions to be more favorable, more downwelling. They pull in water with higher pH. So that was a very, because of our knowledge of how the upwelling worked, that was an adaptation to their system. But you're absolutely right. We, the, I should say the water that reaches our coast takes 50 years to, to get there. So we're seeing CO2 levels from 50 years ago. We know that over time, CO2 is going up. So we have a lot more low pH waters coming our way. How can you stand it? <laughs> <laughs> How can we all stand it? How come we aren't all just going, oh my gosh? Well, hey, this is the point I make. is uh, We're trying our darndest here to learn more about the ocean and see how it works, right? And we're putting out these gliders. And we're measuring lots of stuff, but it's only in a little place. We're trying to make the case that we should be learning a lot more about the ocean. And I hope Dr. Lubchenco made that point, is that we ought to be investing in exploration of our own 
planet's ocean so we can get ready and understand what's going on. No, well, we probably already know enough. Maybe we need to be investing in what can we do about this? I think, I think it's what we all know, right? That we have to, we have to change our absolute reliance on, on uh, fossil fuels. And the, in the easiest way to do that is to uh, you know, look to alternative energy sources. The, the, uh, I, I'm not sure I'll have this, and Nick, Nick says I'm going too long, but it's not a very big set of square miles that you get solar energy from and you're producing electricity for the whole nation. It's pretty remarkable. And that's we should, yeah, goal, we should stop and go outside. And yeah, look yeah. At these Jack and his crew will be out front uh, in the building to talk with you about the gliders, show them to you, demonstrate if you like. Maybe they can fly them up and down. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.